the manner so we need to derive the boundary rail equations from the navy stokes equations so the governing equations for the flow of a two dimensional incompressible fluid can be summarized by these two set of equations which is denoted by equation 1 and these equations are usually called the navier stokes equation and they completely govern the behavior of a newtonian fluid which is subjected to the appropriate boundary conditions and this takes into account the fact that the solution may be unsteady now if we were able to solve these equations efficiently and robustly there would be no need for simplification such as the euler equations or the potential flow equation but unfortunately there are only a few analytical solutions to the navier stokes equations like even for the simplest flows the analytical solutions are hard to obtain so the only alternatives are to either solve these equations numerically or to obtain the simplifications to the navier stokes equations while retaining some of the characteristics of the original equation fortunately although the various terms in the equation 1 can be difficult to calculate quite a few of them are usually very small for typical applied aerodynamics applications and can be neglected altogether now in order to identify the terms which can be neglected we now perform an order of magnitude analysis which has the objective of identifying the rough magnitude of the various terms in the navier stokes equation and to drop those that are small compared to the other terms in the equation Our derivation is based on the observation that the proper boundary condition in a viscous flow, that is solid wall, is the low slip condition. Empirically, it has been observed that a viscous flow sticks to the surface of the body. In a frame of reference with the body stationary, this boundary condition reduces to V equals to zero. now in case of inviscid flows the only boundary condition that we have specified is the flow tangency boundary condition but in case of viscous flow the order of the partial differential equation increases by 1 so this requires us to impose a condition on the tangential velocity component thus enforcing the slow slip condition now although the reynolds number of the flow will give us an indication of the value of the ratio of inertial terms versus the viscous terms and although this number is typically large for flows of aerodynamic interest there must be some areas of the flow where the reynolds number is much smaller than that which would be calculated using the reference length of the body of interest otherwise the viscous terms would be negligible everywhere the inviscid approximation would be uniformly valid and it would be impossible to satisfy the slow slip boundary condition now fundamental to the estimation of the values of the various terms in equation 1 is the definition of a characteristic length scale the distance which one needs to move in each of the coordinate directions in order to see a pre specified change in the value of the variable of interest empirically it has been found that the characteristic lengths in the x and y coordinate directions differ substantially in magnitude for the purposes of this discussion we will assume this following figure which shows a wall which is aligned with the x axis the y axis is in the direction normal to the wall now the boundary layer will develop along the x coordinate now if we move on to the shape of a typical air foil or wing as we can see in this figure we can locally define a coordinate which is tangential to the surface of the air foil that is along the s direction and the one which runs perpendicular to the surface of the air foil that is n at every point along the upper and the lower surfaces now we will further assume that typical changes in the relevant variables occur with a characteristic length of l approximate to c in the x direction while they occur with characteristic length delta in the y direction now the value of delta will be associated with the boundary layer thickness which will again end up being a small quantity when compared to the convective length scale l now for this small region of the flow uh, called the boundary layer to exist the characteristic lengths l and delta must be in such proportions the viscous terms are just as important as the inertia terms inside of it 
because outside the boundary layer the viscous terms can be neglected altogether and the inverse approximation is perfectly valid so next we will consider ve to be the flow speed outside the boundary layer then we can approximate the velocity u to be approximated as ve and the y scale to be approximated as the delta of y scale therefore we have from these u is approximately same order of magnitude as ve velocity now since v vanishes at stagnation points the change in u in the x direction can be as large as v and we can write do u by do x to be of the same order of magnitude as v e by n now from the no slip boundary condition we have u equals to 0 at y equals to 0 this is from the no slip boundary condition the change of u in the y direction can also be as large as v and then we can write do u by do y is approximated as v upon delta now from the continuity equation we have do v by do y equals to minus of do u by do x which is again approximated to v by l as we have seen earlier in this equation however the order of magnitude analysis for this term is do v by do y is of the order of del v by delta now putting these two last set of equations together that is 2 and 3 and considering the fact that v equals to 0 at y equals to 0 we can see that v when we approximate it to del v when we approximate it to delta by l times v e within the boundary layer so we can see that the u component of velocity is much larger than the v component within the boundary layer now we can estimate the other terms of the navier stokes equation we can approximate these terms by uh, like the following cases that is rho u times rho u by dx as rho v square by l similarly for the rho v term the uh, mu do 2 u by do x square can be approximated as mu times v by l square likewise rho v times dv by dy is rho v square times delta by l we know that the pressure gradient terms must be balanced by the other terms in the equation and we will use this knowledge to find the estimates of their magnitude now from the estimates above we can conclude that the two inertia terms are of the same order of magnitude within the boundary layer and so they must carry both terms in, in the simplification of the navier stokes equation the viscous term involving x derivatives is much smaller than the one involving the y derivatives if we assume do delta to be very less than l and within the boundary layer the largest of the viscous terms is comparable in magnitude to the inertial terms only if rho times v square by l is comparable in comparable magnitude to mu times v by delta square or in other words we can write as delta by l is to mu upon rho v times l which equals to 1 upon square root of rho by square now under the assumption stated above that uh, delta upon l is equal to 1 upon uh, square root of reynolds number both the dominant viscous terms and mu times do to v by do y square and the inertial terms are of the same magnitude since these two terms balance the pressure gradient term the upper bound on the value of do p by do y must be identical that is do p by do y must be identical to delta upon l times rho times v square by l otherwise the pressure gradient terms could be uh, could be unbalanced therefore as in the x momentum equation all the three terms are of the same magnitude which means that we should keep all the terms as we did with the f momentum equation however the difference lies in the fact that the estimate of the magnitude of these terms has been shown to be 
do uh, delta upon l times rho times v square by l which is much smaller than the magnitude of the equivalent terms in the x momentum equation by a factor of delta upon l now if this value delta upon l is small we may then make an approximation for the whole y momentum equation we may consider any uh, we, we we may consider any of the terms in the equation to be negligible that is rho u times rho v by rho x is equal approximately equal to rho v times rho v by rho y which is equivalent to rho p by rho y again equivalent to mu times rho 2 v by rho y squared and this is finally equivalent to this term and all these are small however the most attractive term that we can set to zero is the pressure gradient one since it provides immediate information regarding the fact that the static pressure remains constant along the boundary layer. Moreover, this observation will also allow us to produce the boundary layer in visit coupled methods that will be very useful in practice. Now, since the normal pressure gradient is found to be zero in the limit of very high Reynolds number, the pressure on the wall is effectively equal to the pressure at the edge of the boundary layer, which can be calculated using an invisible method. Because of this situation, the pressure is said to be impressed on the boundary layer by the outer inviscid flow. Therefore, in the solution of the boundary layer equation, so we will consider P, the static pressure, to be a known quantity. So, the Navier-Stokes equation can now then be simplified to rho times u do u by do x plus v times do u by do y equals to minus of do p by do x plus mu times do 2 u by do y square and do p by do y equals to 0 considering pressure gradient almost negligible along the perpendicular direction which together with the continuity equation forms the boundary layer equations we thus derive that the boundary layer equations uh, starting from the initial Navier-Stokes equation for two-dimensional frames. Thank you. I'll next briefly describe the contributions of Ludwig Prandtl, emphasizing on the importance of his contributions to modern aerodynamics. Prandtl made decisive advances in boundary layer and wing theories, and his work became the fundamental material of aerodynamics. He was an early pioneer in streamlining airships, and his advocacy of monoplanes greatly advanced heavier than air aviation. He contributed to the frontal blowout rule for subsonic airflow to describe the compressibility effects of air at high speeds. In addition to his important advances in the theories of supersonic flow and turbulence, he made notable innovations in the design of wind tunnels and other aerodynamic equipment. He also devised a soap film analogy for analyzing the torsion forces of structures with non-circular cross-sections. Prandtl is regarded as the founder of fluid dynamics and specially made a name for himself with his boundary layer theory. He was a prominent German physicist who is considered to be the father of aerodynamics. He has made decisive advances in the boundary layer and wing theories and his work became the basic material of aeronautics. He also made important contributions to the theories of supersonic flow and turbulence besides contributing to the wind tunnel and other aerodynamic equipment development. His most significant contribution during the period after World War I was his work on the airfoil theory. The lift force in wings was fairly well understood and he then turned to the explanation of drag. The boundary layer which gave rise directly to the skin friction which was much too small to account for the wind drag was also discovered by him. He also went on working with a third contribution leading to the induced drag. He had recognized that the presence of lift causes a trailing vortex to be induced in the shape of a long distorted horseshoe with its base at the airport where the flight began and it ends at the wing tips which continually generates a vortex. These are some of the many notable achievements and contributions of Ludwig Prandtl in the field of modern aerodynamics. Thank you.